it's time. I'm going to do something pretty unprecedented. And I don't know if it's people's fear, um, embarrassment. I don't, I don't know why I haven't seen this before. And I've looked. Uh, when I was very early in the game, I needed to understand how people arrived. Shut up, Cricket. How people arrived at... <clears throat> um, at the numbers that they were charging and, and how their businesses were running. There were a couple of videos where dudes were talked very vaguely about overarching principles of how they ran their business. And that was helpful. But I think it's time we got down and dirty. Oh, I, I like money. Yeah. How many billion? It's 80, Frito. It's 80 billion dollars. That's a mighty big minus, isn't it? Yeah. I like money. All right. The first thing you got to figure out is who you're selling your stuff to or who you will sell your stuff to. Are you um, surrounded by horses? Because tack is a real good option if you have that capability. I have a bunch of Amish people where I live that do that already. So I don't want to put myself in that competitive market and fight against those dudes. I don't have the capability of doing garments, although... With all the MCs running around, I could make jackets and chaps and vests and all kinds of stuff. And I could rake them over the coals. But that's it's outside of my venue, so I stick with, with my small goods. And knowing that, um, I talked to you before a little bit about how much I'm charging based on the market that I'm in. I mean, it's in Appalachian County. We don't have a lot of money, so I've got to keep it affordable for people. Um, but within that... I mean, I, I'll go crazy, and, and I have my heavy sellers or, or sheaths, holsters, and, and some bags and purses, but I, I, periodically I'll just say, well, let's, you know, I have a laser. I can customize, you know, keychains with people's names on them, and if you have 17 kids in your family, we can get everybody, you know, a $5 Christmas present or whatever. So that's, you cater to the market that you're in and the clientele that you want. You have to understand what it is that they need they're, they're going to have a problem and you have to solve that problem for them. Um, and you have to differentiate yourself in some kind of way. So that's your target market. Keep them in mind. They are at the forefront of all that you do. Okay, let's perform a real quick target audience analysis. We'll see what my demographics look like. So that's, I guess, uh, maybe I'm, Selling to, are you selling to those people? Is there anybody over there? Yeah, so that's 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 my audience. Your your results may vary. I prototyped a backpack. I made it just to see if I could do it. It was hard and I hated it. And I would charge somebody three hundred dollars to sell it to them. Um, so maybe that's not the right answer. I can push out. A 500 tiny little pouches at you know the local ren fair or whatever and and make that amount of money so do what makes sense do what you can sell and don't kill yourself this is not supposed to be terrible bob and rain have agreed to pull back the doors bust open the books to make a call for help all right this is what we're here for. Without further ado, let's grab it. Forgive this. I was excited that I made my own book, so I used it. 2022. We did a grand. Yeah, we did a grand in revenue. Eight up 590 in materials, 660 in labor. I made 44 items. I gave away five uh, for charity events, so I wound up selling 39 items total for the entire year. It was not a great year. And as a result, I was 250 bucks in the red. My margin was a negative 25% and my average sales were 26 bucks over the the course of selling 39 items. I had had better years, <clears throat> but that was just an example of one that just kind of went south. The way I arrived at these numbers and the things that I I listen, I'm no financial genius. Uh, I can tell you this, 
when I worked for 84 Lumber back in the day, Joe Hardy's philosophy was give everybody in the company the profit and loss statement so that everybody can be working towards the solutions. We see a problem with delivery. Do you see a problem with that? Yeah, I do. Why are we having a problem with delivery? Is it the trucks? No. Is it the drivers? No. Is it the way the yard's laid out? Yes. Okay, cool. Anybody that work in the yard, you got some advice for how to change the layout and make it, you know, more efficient, more functional? You know, and the, the, the $7 an hour yard guy was like, yeah, I got an idea. And we tried it and it worked and we saved, you know, whatever, $60,000 a year in, in shipping costs because we weren't having trucks sitting around paying people to do nothing. So <clears throat> my basic understanding of business is this. You need to know what your profits coming in are and your losses going out are. And there's a simple, it's just tiny math and a little bit of logic involved. Um, you have to know what your cost of goods sold is or COGS. And how much does it, how much does it actually cost me in materials and labor to make a knife sheath, for example? And then you set the imaginary number of margin percentage. What, how much would I like to make on this thing? What's fair? And the reason I say it's imaginary number is it's not really, it's based on the market, but like grocery stores make an average of a 1% margin. They get creamed. They have to work really hard to make as much money as say a car dealer who might be pulling in, you know, 15% margin or a high ends uh, leather worker might be might be asking for seventy percent margin. You know, a lot of the garments that you see are are high margin items. Your t shirt at Walmart is is a one percent, but but your blouse from you know the department store is is a one hundred and fifty percent markup. So that's where we're at. There's a one of the things that I looked at first was how do I use the money that I have? And there's a an ex thing that exists, the profit first operating system. And basically you're paying yourself before you're paying any of the other bills. So I have a 30% should that whatever money you take in should go to your operating expenses, 40%, um, 50% goes to your personnel. And I broke that up into my leadership and my research. So if I'm going to spend time, you know, I don't know, tour in Peru to see how Peruvian leather workers do it. Uh, that's accounted for in my budget. 15% tax rate because goddamn them. Um, and 5% profit. So that's, this is my cost of labor. This is the, <clears throat> the, the profit I expect to get out of the goods. They're, they're stacked on top of each other, but for good reason. And you'll see why in a minute. So here's how I price it out. These are 2022 prices, so they're a little outdated, but the idea, if you're gonna track this for yourself, this might be a good thing to come up with. If you're, um, if you have any kind of uh, consistent materials that you use, if you're always ordering something different to fill a, a, I don't know, a whim or a customer need, then this is harder to do. But because all of my materials veg tan and I go three, four ounce, four, five ounce, six, seven, eight ounce, it's easy for me to break that out. You know, I got 2,880 inches in a side divided by the cost of the material at that time. So my four ounce was cost me four cents an inch. My six ounce was five cents an inch. And my eight ounce was six cents an inch. And knowing that, now I can just do a simple calculation. You know, how much is that piece well it's you know 56 or 560 inches and I'm gonna multiply it by that number uh, snaps rivets dies edging materials uh, including token all um, and if I'm for gun holsters anything that metal is gonna touch the inside um, if it's gonna come in contact with a dyed piece metal reacts very poorly to to alcohol based dyes so I was putting rig gun grease on the inside of all my sheaths and holsters just to make sure it, it protected what was inside them you can order in bulk and get that number down but and that's not certainly not what I charge this is my my cost for these individual items um, and you know if I throw a buck on for every snap or a buck for every buckle or a buck for every time I slap some dye on something it 
it evens out at the end of the day. So once you got your material pricing down, then you can move on to if you have repeatable products. And at the time, I was pushing out a lot of sheaths. My blacksmiths were working me overtime, and so I knocked it down by the size of the blade, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 inch. And here's what's really interesting about that. The material size obviously increases as you get a longer blade. Your costs increase, the cost of goods sold, but my prices did not. And they had not changed from the time I initially set that up with my blacksmith and made some corrections. So this has been hanging around since like 2017. The difference for me is my margin percentages decrease dramatically as I increase the size of the blade. 32, 35% margin for a four inch a camper, 32% if I'm doing like a six inch, you know, uh, uh, hunting knife, 30% margin if I'm doing like a kitchen knife or, or some sort of a chopper. A Bowie's tend to run in that eight inch to 10 inch range, 27% for a 10 inch, 23% for a 12 inch. And after that, it just goes straight downhill. So if I'm doing anything special, and I was pushing out a lot of the, the G10 daggers. Um, they're all, you know, G10 scale material. And then they were, there was no connective material in there. So I didn't have any rivets. I didn't have any steel. It was all, it was all just two pieces of leather and stitching with a belt loop. Um, so I was, I was able to push that out. K bars, same thing. I did a lot of those um, and a lot of the, the duplex, the knife on top of a knife in the same sheath. And I ran those numbers up because they're specialty items. It was, I didn't feel guilty about asking for that dollar amount for, for those particular knives. Um, it, there's a lot of work involved. There's a lot of wait time. You know, you know how it is. You, you dye something and you wait and you wet form something and you wait and you put, token all on the edges and you grind your fingers to the bone and then you spray it with resiline and you wait. So everything kind of had a, a waiting stage attached to it. You can do this. I did the same thing with sheaths, holsters, anything that I was pushing out frequently enough to be able to calculate um, a, an easy calculation for, for something that I, I somebody asked me for, hey, I got this 10 inch Bowie. Can you see that? Yeah, it's 30 bucks. Anything over 12 inches is, is going to get more expensive because it's more intricate and more work. So that's the upshot of that. Um, yeah. You know everything that I know. And I've updated, I've modernized since then. I'm working off of an Excel spreadsheet with a profit and loss statement. But it basically has the same information in it. And what's cool is if you can filter out, put, there's, you can, you can never have too much information on the spreadsheet because when it comes time to push stuff out to the accountant and file taxes, then you can just, you know, hide particular columns that, that wouldn't mean anything to that person. But then you can show them again when it comes time for you to review your information and you can like, oh, over the course of a year, how did I do with this particular product? How many of these did I push out and how much money did I make off of it? And do I want to do I want to capitalize on that for the next year and sell more of those instead of wasting my time with things that, you know, I'm going to make a bunch of pre-made items that don't sell. Focus on on that, which makes you money. So I hope that was very helpful to you. Stand by for some more tips. All right, let's talk production and studio arts. This is a five gallon bucket. This is a piece of one and a half inch PVC with a hole drilled into it with a camera mount camera mount phone mount so I don't I don't some kind of clamp so if I'm doing work on the bench you're getting the over-the-shoulder close-up if I need to do something farther away 
or a broader perspective. I can always take that little guy out of that hole that I drilled in the PVC and I drop it in the top. And then you get a, a more bird's eye view. Uh, so yeah, so there's all my capabilities. The videos that I make are all produced on a phone and I'm, I apologize for the terrible quality and the terrible audio, but this is where we are. One of these days I'll be independently wealthy. Today is not that day. Now, for those of you who joined in the last session, this is a continuation of that video. Um, I'll put a picture of it somewhere, but I can't link it because I'm not that smart. If you've stuck with me this long, thank you. I don't know why, but I really appreciate it. Um, I have some additional pieces of painful wisdom uh, that I picked up along the way, and I hope it serves you well. Um, and don't make the same mistakes that I did. Uh, I didn't make all these mistakes, but they were potential pitfalls that I avoided narrowly. The first being the I, I understand that you're excited and I'm very enthusiastic about starting off on this new adventure that you're doing or, or you're considering making a permanent change to, you know, I'm going to work six gig jobs instead of one day job. Uh, don't do that. Don't. You should, you should not think about that. Sell a product and then buy more material with that money. Don't, don't spend it on the electric bill or, or buying toys you should reinvest it back into your business and you can you should continue reinvesting into your hobby until it becomes a job um it took five years to for me to build up any kind of a of clientele i'm still doing word of mouth advertising i don't i don't push out any ads i don't you know send mailers i don't collect client lists of with addresses to do direct marketing i don't i probably should i should probably email everybody on this youtube channel that that has been so gracious to to subscribe but i'm not you know a, a seedy dirt bag so i'm not going to do that um and i don't i can't afford to be overwhelmed um i don't have a high production shop i don't have an assembly line i don't have a staff i am the labor so my presence is required every time somebody says hey can you do this and i have to take that into consideration so but you you saw one year's worth of numbers and you know one year it might be three thousand dollars in sales the next year it might be six thousand dollars in sales but that's not you know your your 50 60 70 hundred thousand dollar a year job so don't give it up until uh, i don't ever maybe i don't know it's up to you but i'm i want you to be careful about that i don't want to see you put yourself in a bad place um some real quick tips for getting by once you're, you saw, I didn't change my price since 2017 because once it's locked in, um, the expectation is set. And if I went to my blacksmith and I said, Hey, guess what? You know, your prices just went up $20 a sheath. He'd be like, okay, okay, thanks. Well, we'll just ship them without sheaths then. Um, it, it's a value added service that he's paying for out of his pocket. So I can't crush his profits. Raising prices is absolutely the last resort. It may have to happen depending on the leather market. If if I go to reorder a side and it's twice as much as what it was the last time I ordered, I, obviously I can't operate at a loss. That's not my point. Um, but but that's going to be the last thing I do. I'm going to try and make cut costs wherever I can. Um, ordering in bulk is very helpful. So especially for hardware. You know, if you're going through Buckle Guy or you're going through um, Silverado or if you're going through Tandy or wherever, try and get the 100 pack instead of the 10 pack and you can save yourself a couple ounces here and there. Um, barter. Barter like you're, like it's the apocalypse, like your life depends on it. You can make some pretty sweet trades with some people who have who have what you need and you have what they need. And that doesn't just apply to products that applies to services too. I have, I have worked a wonderful deal or two with my attorney because he likes to shoot and he, you know, I can get him, you know, a shotgun pouch to go show off at the club or 
I can get him a holster for his collector's vintage, whatever it is that he's carrying around. And, and as a result, you know, maybe he'll do a wool for me. So there's 250 bucks that I didn't have to spend or, you know, Hey, can you review this contract to make sure I'm not getting robbed? So that's, that's a big deal. Um, and it, you know, it, it never hurts to ask. You're already at no. So you might as well ask the question. And if they say, no, that's ridiculous. I'm not doing that. And you can say, okay, that's, that's fine. But it was worth a shot because what if, what if the guy says yes, then you're, you know, you're providing a, a, what was to you a $50 product for a $250 service. That's, that's good money right there. Um, so let the experts do the expert things. I, I consult with the attorney. I consult with the accountant. Um, I can't, those are not, I don't know how to fly a helicopter, so I'm not even going to get, go try it to do that on my own. I'm going to let the people who fly helicopters do their thing. Um, I don't, it's not worth it for me to kill myself going through the Ohio revised code to learn the law when I have a guy who has it memorized already and has experienced the pain, um, of trying to get through, you know, some of the, the dealings of the business world. Um, keep your accounts separate. Don't, don't blend personal and business finances. I mean, I go through a, a tiny little local bank. It's got about five branches and, or a credit union and they all offer free checking or free savings or whatever. And just set one of those things up as a business account. And, you know, I'm, I have one that I opened in my name doing business as, and, uh, and all the, the money that I make in the business goes back into that account. And <laughs> I did have to buy some some materials pretty recently. So it, it was pretty pitiful. But, but it doesn't, the only, I have to be very intentional about not, about not, dumping too much of my own finances into the business to keep it alive. If the business is not doing well enough on its own two legs, I, I would have to give it up. I can't, I can't afford to feed this machine just for the sake of, you know, something to do every evening and every weekend. Um, so make sure that you're, you're not killing yourself there. And how about, how about this? I saved the best for last. Make do with what you have. You saw my, my bucket production schedule with my PVC pipe. You've seen how I'm operating out of a, a cold slash hot slash dank cricket infested spider ridden basement. And, and I'm doing those things because I don't have a warehouse to set up, you know, a beautiful clean shop with great lighting and, you know, and have a million dollars worth of camera equipment to push out videos to y'all. I'm making do with what I got. And when I make enough money to buy uh, a better quality side of leather, I might put the money there instead of something that's working just fine. If you said to me, your video quality sucks and it's driving us crazy and we can't hear you, then maybe that's where the money goes but it's all based off of prioritization and what I have and what I got. You've seen me. I don't, I haven't ordered a pound O board yet to punch holes in leather because I'm still quite satisfied with the way my one by fours are holding up. And, and then the tines on my pricking irons aren't getting damaged. So why change a good thing? You do you boo, but I, I don't see the need in spending money if you're not making enough to justify it and maybe you would, maybe that you, maybe your MO is, you know, to build out entire superhero costumes and you're going to sell them for $3,000 a piece to, you know, folks that do cosplay professionally. Great. You know, live and be well, man. But that's not, that's not my world. Um, rendezvous, the, the guys that dress up in pioneer outfits and go out and, you know, fake murder Indians. If, if that's, if that's your gig, you have a very, you're one of a very few select people that would do that. So I don't, once again, I don't have the, the patience or the, uh, the equipment necessary to put together an entire, you know, buckskin shirt. That's not, 
That's not what I do. So I found my niche and I love these people and I, I'm not going to sell them out in the hopes that I can make more money somehow. Um, it's just not, it's not worth it to me. So you make your decisions, but then, you know, just know that there are consequences when you step outside of your boundary. And that's also one of the reasons that I don't have a problem sharing the information that I share. I don't feel like I'm in competition with you all because, you know, we could all pick a million different avenues of leatherworking and never touch hands. It's, it's crazy, not just geographically, but, but even in the, the, the types of projects that we choose to do, you know, I'm very intentionally put in the space that I'm in so that I don't have to compete and, and Betty Sue up the road and I aren't fighting for the same customer base. So I'm trying not to expand my influence beyond the Tri-County, Quad County, Ohio area that I'm in, plus a little bit of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> it's just not, I'm, it's nice to know that if somebody orders something, I can just put it in the truck, run it up the road a quarter mile and drop it off. And save them some shipping costs, save me some aggravation. I get paid faster. So, oh, that's another thing. Um, if you've ever done business with me, you know this. But I don't, <clears throat> one of these days this is going to bite me in the ass. But until now, it's served me very well. I don't collect any payment until the people get the item and they say, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. Um... It's just, I don't know. I, I want the world to be oper to be able to operate on a handshake, and I know that that's that may not be reality, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep fighting that as long as I can. Thankfully, everybody has been very gracious. Nobody has taken advantage of me, and I hope that by treating them fairly, they're gonna treat me fairly. That may but that may be naive, and I may be stupid, but we'll find out. Um, and that applies to even things that are customized with, you know, engraved your name on something. There's no, you know, I got to find another Robert W. Smith to sell it to. Um, so we'll, <laughs> it's, it's a risky proposition. I also offer the, my lifetime guarantee. If I die, you are SOL, but as long as I'm alive, I stand by my work. If if something breaks, I'm going to fix it. And you may want to have a more limited lifetime on yours. It, it's it's all up to you. But as I said when we talked about identifying a market, I want I want to I have to differentiate myself in some kind of way as a as a leader. Um, and that's how I choose to do it. You know, I, you buy it one time for me and then if it falls apart on you, if, I don't care if you're out in the woods, dragging it through the mud behind your four wheeler. If you bring it back to me and say, Hey, the snap failed. Guess what? I'm putting a new snap on it for you. Cause it's 10 minutes out of my day. And if it, if it gives you the warm fuzzy that, you know, just like the day you bought it uh, great, it cost me 10 cents. So I think that's, that's a small price to pay for for maintaining such a, a loyal base of people who are more than thrilled to say, oh, this guy did this thing for me and you should totally order from him. And then lo and behold, here comes, you know, $150 worth of purses up the turnpike. So listen, I, this video ran a really long time, but I think it was important that, that y'all saw this because as I said, I looked for it. I couldn't find it. I didn't. And that seems to be one of the most common questions on all the beginner forums is, well, how much should I charge? And the answer is, you know, I don't know, whatever the market will bear, which is kind of right, but you can also help make that decision. All right, man. I love you all. I will talk to you in the next one.